Now I will call uh, Professor Parta Gose, who is an honorary scientist at the National Academy of Science, India. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gose. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start out by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this very important and very interesting conference. I'm going to talk about quantum theory. Now, what is quantum theory and why is it important and why is it exciting? We all know and we've been talking about the fact that everything is made out of atoms and molecules. But if you actually look at the behavior of atoms and molecules, you'll find that they behave in a very strange fashion which doesn't fit in with the behavior of objects of our daily experience like chairs or tables or cricket ball or billiard ball. They're quite different. And uh, that has uh, brought in a lot of debate as to what all this means. And there is a particular theory called quantum mechanics which describes these objects very accurately. But it's very difficult to understand in the sense, not that it is uh, mathematically very intractable, but its interpretation becomes very, very uh, debatable. And it's sometimes said that if one has studied quantum mechanics and, and not been confused, then one hasn't understood it at all. So I'm going to <clears throat> uh, put across to you some of these confusions. So let me start with a five-minute video which will uh, tell you that w w what is or one of the most strange aspects of atoms and molecules, that is of any macro, micro object, which eventually make up macro objects. Here they are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now. Let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits.
bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself. Uh, completely describe physical reality or is it an epistemic an incomplete state of knowledge about this underlying reality this is a question that has not yet been fully answered what is this wave one can write down its wave uh, uh, the, the equation for the wave that's the famous Schrodinger equation <clears throat> but that doesn't really complete the story so the Copenhagen School, represented mainly by Niels Bohr, Heisenberg and others, Pauli, they advocated the former interpretation that it is actually, it is the reality. Whereas Einstein favored the epistemic view. And I'll, this will uh, help me to get to the next weirdness of quantum physics, which is called entanglement. Now Einstein could, being the deep thinker he was, he could immediately see through 
the mathematics of quantum mechanics that if two objects, A and B, are brought together and then they separate out, then the state of the system A, B together will not be what you would expect by putting A and B together. That is, that state, the state of entanglement, will be more than just the sum of the parts. And he showed that if we have two such systems, which are spatially separated, as far as you like, one can be here, the other can be in the next galaxy or many galaxies beyond, doesn't matter. And they're non-interacting. But they've got entangled by quantum, um, quantum theory says they should get entangled in the following sense. Now when I write this state, just bear with me a little bit of mathematics. Uh, this state, psi, is written as 1 over root 2 times some function of the positions A and B times a state A which is spinning, say, upwards and a state B which is spinning downwards, whatever, maybe the upwards or downwards, doesn't matter, one way and the opposite way, or A spinning downwards, B spinning upwards. So this state cannot be written as the product of a state A and a state B. And this is what is called entanglement, the states of A and B are non-factorizable. You cannot write it as state of A times state of B. No. It has to be written in some funny way like that. Now you can say that I don't want to measure its spin up or spin down. I, I want to measure it in some other basis like, say, circular polarization or elliptic polarization, then you would write a similar state where by A plus, I mean it's a right circular polarization, B is left circular, and again you will get the same state that you cannot write it as a factorized state of some, some state of A times some state of B. It's not. And this will create problems. And this is what Einstein argued, and the argument is extremely simple. Supposing you have, you want to make a measurement on A. Now, as you can see, A is both spin up, as well in the second term it's spin down. And there's a one by root two factor here, which simply means, if you observe it, 50% of the time you'll find it spinning upwards, and 50% of the time you'll see it spinning downwards. Similarly with B. But if A is spinning upwards and B is in a different galaxy, it will suddenly be spinning downwards. The other term will simply disappear. That is wave function collapse. If you find A spinning downwards 50% of the time, then the moment you see it, you know, in a faraway galaxy, B will suddenly be spin up. So Einstein said, this is spooky action at a distance. I don't believe it. And he also gave a very simple argument as to why, if this happens, quantum mechanics has to be an incomplete description of nature. Why? Because <clears throat> if I make a measurement on A, and B is so far away it cannot be affected instantly, then the state of B just simply cannot change. Okay? That's clear. And for every state of B, there must be, in your theory, only one wave function psi. This must be a one-to-one -one correspondence, and that is why what he called a complete description. If I have a psi that describes uniquely a particular state of a system. Now, if you, can, if you look at the two lines, you will see that depending on what you choose to measure on A, you get a different wave function for B. If, if A, you chose to 
measure its spin upwards, you had found B spin downwards. But in case you chose to measure A in some other state, you will find, your theory tells you, that the wave function for B is different from the first case. Which means the same physical state of B somewhere else, which should have a single wave function, your theory is telling you it has to have at least two, if not more. And therefore your theory has to be incomplete. Alternatively, if you say that my theory is correct, then you have to admit that spooky action at a distance must occur. That this was the great dilemma. And this was the basis of the whole problem of interpreting what is happening. What is this psi? So quantum mechanics, what he showed really is that quantum mechanics, as formulated at that time and still now, is incompatible with the assumptions that there is a reality and that no spooky action at a distance occurs, no telepathy. Hence, given this kind of theory, quantum mechanics, the only interpretation of psi compatible with realism and locality is epistemic and hence incomplete. Epistemic in the sense that for same ontic state, I have several uh, quantum states in my theory. That is an incomplete description according to Einstein. Okay, now he had another very interesting uh, experiment uh, in mind. This is a thought experiment. In 1927 already, at the Solvay conference, he pointed this out. Supposing you have some atoms going through a little hole in a plate, and on the other side it is spreading out like a wave, as you saw in the, in the video. And you place a lot of detectors all around. Now, any wave, which spreads out so uniformly would make you expect that there's a chance of seeing the particle everywhere with uniform probability. But quantum mechanics says that's not the case. You will see it in only one place. And the, when you see it in that one place, the wave just disappears from the rest of, the, of space. And he said, this is, this is simply, I, I have never seen any wave like this. And this is, again, spooky action at a distance, which I reject. Now, since then, this debate has been going on for a long time without any conclusive, uh, any, con any definite conclusion coming through. But <coughs> since, since 2010, there's been a, a significant progress mainly due to Harrigan and Speckens writing a paper in which they introduced a mathematical framework. I will not go into it in, in any great detail. <clears throat> a framework of ontological models of operational theories, which has brought about clarity in discussions on ontic versus epistemic states. I will not go through this uh, at all. But surprisingly, several theorems have been proved since then within that framework, particularly uh, the paper by Pusey, Barrett, and Rudolph. It's called the PBR theorem now, which showed that psi, okay, I have to go back, sorry, I have to go back. Uh, so they classified uh, three types of possibilities for psi. One they call psi complete, which means for every ontic state, every real state out there, there is a single psi function. And that exhausts all possibilities. That's called the psi complete model. Or you could have a psi for every ontic state, but supplemented by a few other 
variables which are nowadays called hidden variables and a third possibility which is psi epistemic which I sh which came out of Einstein's analysis for every ontic state represented by that dot in the middle there are at least two possible wave functions if that happens that is called an epistemic state a psi epistemic state now this uh, and, uh, okay and uh, this theorem then said that such state such states if you believe in them will invariably give you results which will contradict those of quantum mechanics so that cannot be an interpretation Kolbeck and Renner went much further and this they claimed that all models except the psi complete ontic model are ruled out and that no other model can have better predictive power now this has been challenged by many for example Girardi and Romano but I don't want to go into those details if you are interested you can also see this rather nice article by Ballantyne called ontological models in quantum mechanics what do they tell us now back to Einstein now, <clears throat> Einstein wrote a famous paper in 1937 together with two other persons Podolsky and Rosen it's called the famous EPR paper Einstein later said that he was not satisfied with that write-up which was actually written by Podolsky because the main point that Einstein wanted to make was lost in the erudition so he wrote a letter to, uh, to Schrodinger and also later on to other people and finally uh, in which he gave him very very simple but a different argument altogether the one that I have given you already earlier this argument is also repeated in his autobiographical notes which were written some, sometimes around 1944 now after giving this in, uh, this uh, argument that quantum mechanics cannot be the final story he says the statistical character of the present theory would then have to be a necessary consequence of the incompleteness of the description of the, of the systems in quantum mechanics and there would no longer exist any ground for the supposition that a future basis of physics must be based on statistics and then he goes on to say it is my opinion that the contemporary quantum theory by means of certain definitely laid down basic concepts which on the whole have been taken over from classical mechanics constitutes an optimum formulation of the connections I believe, however, that this theory offers no useful point of departure for future develop development. This is the point at which my expectation departs most widely from that of contemporary physicists. So the question is now, can we somehow get back the epistemic interpretation the kind of interpretation that Einstein had in mind which is an incomplete description but which does not have the problem of the kind of epistemic states that we talked about the answer is yes you can have it but I will not go into it this is the work that I have recently done with Arun Pati and AK Raja Gopal but I'll skip all this and come to certain basic aspects of this new approach which is this so supporting our view are two conceptual co components the first is an epistemological principle based on an analysis of ideal spin measurements in quantum mechanics now this is the famous stern gerlach experiment every undergraduate learns this as a model of what is meant by a measurement so what happens is that you take an oven of the silver atoms 
and you make them go, uh, you collimate them and make them go through what is called an inhomogeneous magnetic field. That separates the beam into two beams, one going this way, the other going the other way. And the quantum mechanics tells you that if you see all the particles which are going down have spin downwards and those who and the other track has particles which spin up. And this is what is meant by measuring spin. You don't see spin. You see two spots on your plate and then you conclude that there are the ones which are downwards were spinning this way, the one up was spinning that way. But recently, my colleagues, Dipankar Holm and his students, have shown, have actually got an exact mathematical solution to this problem, which was not the case until recently. And they have shown no matter how far you go and how long you wait, these two beams will never completely separate. There will always be a small amount of overlap. <laughs> Which means, if you see the spot here, you cannot conclude that it is spin down. There may be some small fractions of spin up there. And similarly with the one upstairs. So therefore, quantum mechanics itself tells you or teaches you a very, uh, so this should not be ontological, this is epistemological, so there's an error there. So the epistemological principle is this, no preparation measurement operation, that is you prepare a system and then you measure it. No preparation measurement operation performed with macroscopic devices can produce and confirm a sharp microscopic ontic state. That is an element of reality. You just cannot do it. Accordingly, quantum states have to be averages over ontic states. That's the other possibility. The first possibility was a given ontic state is represented by several quantum states. We are saying exactly the opposite. Every quantum state actually is an average over several ontic states. And also, quantum mechanics is basically a probabilistic theory. And therefore, probability comes into the theory in a very uh, essential way. And we adopt the idea that these probabilities will have to be Bayesian. Now, we have talked, we have heard talks about Bayesian probabilities and the brain. So since conditional, <coughs> conditional probabilities are judgments of an agent, it follows that a quantum state assignment is also a judgment of an agent. The collapse of a state that we talked about is then just an updating of an agent's state assignment on the basis of new experience and does not imply any non ontic non-locality. It's an incompleteness, statistical incomplete description. You have written a wave function. When you see something new, you just write another wave function. This does not mean that something violently non-local has hap happened out there. So this is the attitude, and this attitude is shared by what is called cubism or quantum Bayesianism. I've, there are many papers like this, but I, I've just given reference to Fuchs, Merman, and Schack. So conceptually, there is a fundamental difference between them and us. They are also saying the same thing. All this big talk of non-locality, collapse, these things are... Uh, these are non-issues. Non Basically, the wave function is a quantum Bayesian. So you're updating your wave function every time you get new information. But there's one, uh, you see, they follow Bohr, and therefore cubism is dismissive of an underlying reality as an important basis of physics. 
Whereas we would like to follow Einstein in his insistence on such a metaphysical reality. Whatever we are trying to describe is some reality. Yes, our description will forever remain incomplete. And therefore, if we write a psi function, it has to be epistemic. <clears throat> now, I'll skip this. Now, where does cognition and all this come into this, uh, our discussion? How much time do I have left? Uh, Michelle, how much time? Six. Six? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, because of these weird properties of entanglement and so on, which give you a holistic picture, if things are entangled, and everything is entangled with everything, then if you do something here, things across the universe will be affected. And as I said, the sum of parts is not the whole. The whole is more than the sum of parts. Then as I said, a particle can be a wave. It can be in different states at the same time. It can be everywhere. Or it can be in different states of energy. These are some aspects of the reality which we have to come to grips with. These are actually there. So, people have conjectured that cognition is actually a quantum phenomenon that goes beyond Boolean logic. However, quantum mechanics also tells you something very funny. It tells you that when a lot of particles are involved, a lot of fundamental particles are involved to make a macroscopic object like a cricket ball, or much smaller than that, a grain of uh, sand, then because that is strongly coupled to the environment, all its quantum properties disappear. It behaves like a classical particle. This is called decoherence. Now the human mind, as we have seen, consists of hundreds, billions neurons, and each neuron is a huge object compared to elementary particles. This is a gigantic macroscopic object which is open to the environment, and therefore it must decohere. And this is a problem that those who think it's quantum, or everything that goes on in the mind, like consciousness, cognition, is quantum, they have to answer this question. But recently, there's a lot of empirical evidence that this kind of entanglement, which was thought to be purely quantum, actually can be seen in light, in classical light. I had predicted this in 2001 at a conference, and a lot of, I was shouted down. But from 2010, a lot of experiments have been done in India and abroad, which have actually established the fact that classical light can be entangled in the following sense. When light propagates, as you all know, it has something called polarization. So there is a propagation happening and some polarization associated with it. These can get entangled. And such beams have been produced. For example, if you take some beam, a laser beam coming, and you can prepare these holograms these days, and after going through, the light becomes a vortex. So these are called vortex beams. So from the left, you have, say, a circularly polarized light coming. Then they can put what is called a spiral face plate and it will become a helical beam, either going right-handed or left-handed. And these beams, the mathematics of these beams tells you that they, if you look at the cross-section of these beams, then they, they will be either polarized like this radially or azimuthally or in a more complicated way. Now, if you ask, what is the polarization of this beam on the left, what will you say? It has so many states of polarization. In other words, you cannot separate 
the polarization out from the main beam which is propagating. This is exactly entanglement. So entangled light has been produced. Uh, here is one example. Uh, this experiment was done in physical research lab in Ahmedabad recently after I proposed it. And what they are doing on the left is they are changing continuously the polarization of that one of those vortex beams. Uh, in this case, they chose a vortex beam which has four components. And as you can see, as this polarization changes, the actual, the, the physical, uh, the propagation modes also change. Now this, this, this is called uh, contextuality. Now we know that <coughs> the macroscopic real world is non-contextual. That is, it has definitely given properties before you observe it. Your observation simply reveals those properties. But quantum mechanics has this strange property that depending on what you choose to observe, you get different results. So it's very non it's very contextual. You see the same contextuality in classical light. And finally, this beautiful experiment they did, they produced uh, a, a entangled classical light, then made it pass through a rotating ground glass. And on the other side, you will see it produces, uh, it's it, it scattered and produces a homogeneous speckle pattern, little dots, speckle. Then you put another focusing uh, lens, L, and collect this light, and lo and behold, what you get back is the entangled state. Which means this entanglement is not as fragile as quantum entanglement, which is the main problem for applying quantum mechanics to the brain. So my humble sub submission is that if you want to understand cognition and this kind of holistic uh, aspects of the mind, you don't necessarily have to invoke quantum mechanics. You can, but then you have to explain how it is not decohering. But already classical light shows that that sort of thing, entanglement and so on, which were considered to be, until very recently, purely quantum, can actually exist in classical light, then uh, there's no, no bar to trying to get theories of the mind which are purely classical and which will give you most of the so-called quantum effects that you like so much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, all, all of them, uh, for uh, this conference and for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. It is really uh, something special. Uh, mm, I'm a physicist, and uh, very often uh, physics conferences are quite boring. It's not the case, this one. So uh, I'm very glad to be here. On the other hand, however, it is quite difficult for me uh, to uh, talk about something which has to do with physics after such a beautiful lecture by Professor Goose. Um, uh, it's not easy to be uh, clear as he has to have been talking of a such uh, uh, beautiful uh, phenomena. Well, uh, the title of my talk is uh, uh, My Double, the arrow of time and the consciousness. I do not know if there is anything to do with consciousness, but in any case, it's uh, nice to spend these 40 minutes with you just uh, uh, pretending that there is something about that. Um, you will see also why I talk of my double. Okay, let me start from an observation of a laboratory, uh, which is called the uh, Lashley Dilemma. Uh, uh, Lashley introduced the concept of mass action in the storage and retrieval of memories in the brain. 
And let me read this quote by him. Uh, we are in the forties. Uh, I put a reference here. Oh, there is a pointer. Okay, how oh, it works. Okay. So, uh, lastly, say here is the dilemma. Nerve impulse are tra here is the dilemma. Nerve impulse are transmitted from cell to cell through definite intercellular connections. Yet, all behavior seems to be determined by masses of excitations. Uh, let me stop for one moment. Here we have a transition from cell to cell, which are two of them, in any possible coupling, to many cells, mass, mass, masses of excitations. So it makes a big difference when you go from small numbers to large numbers. This is very important in uh, physics and uh, in, uh, in many cases, not only in physics. Okay. Uh, okay. Yet all behavior seems to be determined by masses of excitation within general fields of activity. Here there is the introduction of another word, which is a strange word, the fields. Uh, what is a field? We will uh, maybe go back to that. Uh, without regard to particular nerve cells. What sort of nervous organization might be capable of responding to a pattern of excitation without limited specialized path of conductions? The problem is almost universal in the activity of the nervous system. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist, but by uh, getting along with a neuroscientist, I understand that this dilemma is still there. We still do not know how it is po possible that hundreds, some hundred of uh, billions of neurons in, with uh, the addition of a glia cell and water and all that, how out of such uh, so many components, elementary components, could come out a stable functioning of the brain as we see at uh, functional level. This is the point. How is that possible? Uh, on the basis of such, uh, uh, I mean, pointing the, the street to, uh, uh, to what to do, Carl Pribram introduced his, uh, sometimes we call it metaphora, a theolographic metaphora, meaning that the brain, according to Carl Pribram, uh, operates like an hologram namely uh, like uh, um, a coherent state in laser physics, uh, where uh, in each, uh, in each uh, point of, uh, let's say, of a picture uh, is concentrated the information uh, which uh, you find in the, all the other parts of the picture. So the transition from uh, local activity to global activity is clear. Um, uh, this one is uh, Walter Freeman. Uh, I'm like, I like to um, present him to, uh, the picture, his, uh, his photograph to you, because uh, he will be 90 in this next year, and he has been working in neuroscience since, uh, since long, since his life. Uh, uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, on the path of that uh, Lashley dilemma, trying to understand how the brain functions. Uh, so not only how a neuron works. That is crucial to know, uh, but that is only the first step. After knowing all the possible details, we have to put together these details in a, in a consistent frame uh, so to get out the functioning of the whole brain. And this is one of his most, uh, um, uh, how to say, uh, urgent. Um, uh, motivation for his activity. Now, I will talk to you about a model of the brain uh, which was stimulated uh, again by Lashley dilemma, however, to, uh, let me show you, to a Japanese um, a scientist, a, a Japanese uh, physicist, Hiromi Umezawa. He is one of the father of modern quantum field theory, and uh, he was in Naples uh, in the middle uh, of the 60s, and um, 
he went to study the brain as a, uh, a physicist would study a piece of matter, a piece of a condensed matter, because after all, the brain is no more than uh, matter. And he says, in any material, in condensed uh, matter physics, any particular information is carried by certain ordered pattern, maintained by certain long-range correlation mediated by massless quanta. Let me stop. Um, as you see, uh, he talks about condensed matter because he's a, a physicist of elementary particle physics and condensed matter physics. Uh, and he talks about information because there is the problem of a memory. Uh, neuroscientists, they tell us that there are synapses which change uh, their uh, state, uh, there are uh, uh, connections between neurons, uh, there are uh, uh, many special uh, arrangements, but uh, nevertheless, uh, still the problem exists of uh, how some information is recorded and how we recall it. This is not solved the problem, not a solved the problem. So his, uh, his interest was especially in uh, memory. And then he mentioned uh, ordered patterns maintained by long-range correlation mediated by massless quanta. So, uh, ordered patterns. Well, you are an ordered pattern, patterns because you sit in these chairs which uh, have a specific order. We might change the order if you want. And uh, this order arise because uh, you have been uh, coming to this conference and decided to listen to these talks. So, how this ordered pattern has been formed? If you want, let me put it in this way. Uh, which one is the probability of, for me, uh, among to all uh, inhabitants on the Earth, uh, how many? Maybe seven billions. Uh, which one is the probability that uh, myself and uh, that uh, gentleman in the last uh, row, uh, we fall down in the same room for three days? Near zero. But it's not so because we are here, we are here. so this is a, a realized probability of a, with positive result. The point is that there exists a long-range relation, correlation, between me and that gentleman down there. This long-range correlation is our common interest in understanding consciousness, cognition, culture, physics, and so on. So these long-range correlations makes the miracle to pick up two people among seven billions of people, two people, and bring them in the same room. So this is how a crystal is formed. Which one is the probability among billions of atoms in a crystal to sit in their crystalline site? Zero, unless you work out a theory, a model, something you can check in the laboratory, which explain why two atoms very far away, among many, many of them, they sit to form the same crystal. You see, we talk of uh, uh, something which is uh, almost a miracle, but it is... Uh, uh, so, uh, he was saying, he was giving, oh, well, massless quanta. Massless quanta. In quantum mechanics, uh, you should know now, but uh, also in quantum field theory, to each wave you can associate a quantum. So, the electromagnetic radiation, the light, the quantum associated to it is the photon. If you have a crystal, crystals are classified by rigidity, or if you want elasticity, the reverse. So, you have elastic waves, and in a crystal, the quantum of the elastic waves is called phonon. And the phonon is a such massless quanta which span the whole system and keeps the atoms in their seats, in their sides. Uh, it looked to me, say, Umezawa, that 
that this is the only way to memorize some information. Memory is a printed pattern of order supported by long-range correlations. So this is the recipe. He proposed to neuroscience to, uh, how to say, the view to study neuron and glial cell and water in the brain in order to find if there, if is there any pattern, any ordered pattern, which could describe memory. I, uh, in this, mo in this uh, proposal, uh, in the papers he was producing with other collaborators, they were saying that in a first approximation we produce our model uh, by considering uh, the brain as a closed system. Uh, the brain is not a closed system, of course. You cannot close it. You will kill the person. The brain is open on its environment. It is always permanently open. But they were saying, let's, in a first approximation, consider the brain as a closed system. Now, it happened to me to extend their model on their uh, indication to such kind of open uh, situation. So the brain is an open system, and as we say, it is a dissipative system, namely a system which, which exchange with the environment any sort of energy, information, matter, and so on. So when you extend to uh, Umezawa model to the to the dissipation regime, you get what I call the dissipative quantum model of brain. Please notice, the model is quantum, not the brain. This is different from some other model of the brain uh, in which people consider neurons as quantum uh, objects. But the neurons are classical objects. So, in this sense, uh, this model is uh, completely different from those models. Among those, there, are, uh, two ones by, um, there is one by Amerov and Peros, for example, and so on. But this model is different. And it's different also because uh, in that models it is used uh, quantum mechanics. Quantum field theory, here the word field came, uh, quantum is dramatically different. When Dirac wrote this equation in the attempt to extend to relativity the Schrodinger equation, there was a big surprise. Uh, the Schrodinger equation is an equation for one single particle. Dirac equation is an equation for a field, for infinitely many particles. So it describes not one single electron, but the field of electrons, which is completely different matter. So in this sense, uh, I'm using quantum field theory. Uh, namely, we have a system with infinitely many degrees of freedom. And there is the point where the number of particles, if it is large, makes a big difference. So um, I already told you about uh, uh, this uh, NG means Nambu Goldstone, who were the two physicists studying these long-range correlations. And uh, examples I told you already are phonons, magnons in a ferromagnets, uh, Cooper pairs in superconductivity, and so on. Now, in the brain, we have that uh, um, above the 90% of molecules are water molecules. Water molecule is quite light. Uh, in weight, water is uh, about 80%. But if you count the molecules, since water molecules are light, uh, the number of molecules is almost 90%. So a physicist cannot, absolutely cannot miss to consider the role of water in studying the brain. Why? Also because, not only because the number is so large, but also because a water molecule to a physicist is a, an electrical dipole. It's like a needle with a charge, positive charge on one end and a negative one on the other end. Like a magnetic needle, but that is a magnetic. You have also electrical dipoles. So when you have an oscillation of dipoles, you, you get electromagnetic radiation. Uh, this is why your mobile works, because we are in a bath of electromagnetic relation, uh, uh, radiation, and if the, there is a match between the frequency 
uh, in this bat and one of your uh, at the frequency of your dipole in your mobile then your dipole ring so is uh, is something which cannot be missed so uh, in this model the quantum variable are the electrical dipole vibrational field of the water molecules and of the other biomolecules because all bio biomolecules are uh, possess an electrical dipole. Uh, at this point, uh, we talk of a spontaneous breakdown of rotational symmetry of the electrical dipole vibrational field. What means that if you have many arrows it, and there is no specified direction, you have a spherical symmetry. You can go in any direction, any direction is equivalent to another one. But if you try to polarize, as uh, in the experiments of uh, Professor Goes, as if you try to polarize, you might get in-phase oscillations of this dipole. You might get resonance regime for such dipoles. So when you do something like that, you say that you break the rotational symmetry. You see, the word symmetry is a beautiful. Symmetry are beautiful aesthetically in, uh, in, any, in many respects. But they do not have informational content. If you have many streets and you are in the middle, you, you do not know where to go if you want to go to, uh, let's say, Delhi. Then what you have to do, you have to break the symmetry. You have to put an arrow in which is written Delhi is that direction. That arrow breaks the symmetry and introduce an information. So breakdown of symmetry means creation of an order. Order is lack of symmetry. This is a little bit different from everyday life uh, use of word uh, order. Order usually is meant to be uniformity. It's not, that is a symmetry. So order is possibility to make distinctions. Distinguishing one road from another one one direction from another one. So, uh, if we have a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry, then a theorem which has been proved in laboratory tells you that a long-range correlation occurs. When we received the announcement of such conference, there was a breakdown of symmetry. Because before there was nothing, at that point, we were polarized, and we decided to come in this room for three days and to create such an ordered pattern, to share, through this long-range interaction, our interest in listening, discussing about these things. So, in this way, we, cre we create this long-range wave, which we call dipole wave quanta, and these are Nambu Goldstone nodes. As I told you already, neurons, glia cell, and other physiological units are not quantum objects. They are classical objects. Now, the brain is an open system. Uh, we do not have mathematics to describe open systems. What we call the canonical theory, uh, only the canonical theory only describes closed systems. We do not know how to describe an open system unless we close it, unless we consider the other part outside the system or also inside the system, but in such a way all of it can be considered a closed system. Only at that point we can work out our mathematics. This is because we do not know much. As a matter of fact, we, we know nothing. But in any case, we try to do something. So, uh, we have to close the system. Now, uh, the system is our brain. Our brain is embedded in the environment. So we have to consider also the environment. To do that, we might decide to study all tiny uh, mechanisms, all tiny interactions of our brain with the environment. How much hair I'm perspiring, uh, which is the strain I have to put in my voice uh, to let you know what I'm saying. But all of this is not important if you want to study. The only important thing is that you have to balance the flux between your system and its environment. So from such a point of view, 
in a very first rough approximation, the environment becomes the place where the energy, let's say the energy, but it's not only the energy, the energy coming from the system goes. So if you put yourself from the point of view of the environment, in, in the environment you receive is out for the brain, and vice versa. In for the brain is out for the environment. Now, how do you, how do you depict this fact if you work out the formula? Well, you just put a minus in front of the time in the formula when you describe the environment. This is like going on a freeway. You go in one direction, there, there are other people going in the other direction, and you say that they are going backwards, and you mean in space, because if you came from Delhi, the other one is going to Delhi. But you could also say that they go backward in times. This is uh, exact from the point of view of mathematics and even of physics, even if it looks so strange, because the speed is given by the ratio between space and time. To get people going the opposite way to when you go, either you change space, and then you say they go back to Delhi, or you change time, and you say they go backwards. When you study the brain in this environment, the environment appears as the time reversed, because we change the sign of time, the time reversed the copy of the brain. So mathematically, you, you do that by doubling the degrees of freedom. You start with the brain, suppose this denotes some important degrees of freedom of your system, and then you go to a doubled couple, the, the old one you have, but also another one which I put till the year, to mean the environment. So now you have to work with this doubled system. The important point is that you have to balance the energy. The, the energy getting out from the system minus the energy getting in the system, this difference must be zero. Of course, this is a balance in a perfect ideal situation. Uh, it's not zero in general, but what we try every day, every time, is to find an harmony with our environment. Since we do not exchange only energy, we exchange also information, values, and the environment try to to change, tries to change us, and we try to change the environment. The word environment is too uh, cool. Let me say the world. So the world try to change us, we try to change the world. And in such a dialogue, continuous dialogue, always with some unbalance, in such a dialogue, perhaps there is the act of a consciousness. Please don't kill me, but uh, in this view, the consciousness is not something which belongs to me, my consciousness only, does not be belongs only to me. My consciousness includes all of you, because I'm talking to you, and I belong to your consciousness. So consciousness, in this point of view, is relational, is in such a dialogue between me and my double. The double is, is this guy here, is the world. The world is my double. Of course, my double is the world as I see him. And each of us see the world in a different way. So we are each of us as a double. So if we are, I don't know, 100, uh, uh, 80, I don't know how many people uh, we are in this room, actually we are the double. We are 160 if we are 80, because each of us has its own double to whom is talking every day, every moment, also in this moment. Uh, this will bring us to some uh, extension of what I'm saying, but now let, let me go on, on this way. Uh, so, uh, here you find uh, something which I already told you, uh, a tilde denotes the mirror modes, and they account also for all the fluctuations. In the model, these are also quantum fluctuations, but normally in everyday life, these fluctuations correspond to classical 
fluctuations. And here we should fill a gap. How do we go from a quantum model, from a quantum description, to a macroscopic description? At this point, you see, we have a measure of the ordering created by the breakdown of a symmetry, and this is called order parameter, here I call it n, and this n is a measure of the coherence of these uh, massless quanta which are condensed. In this room, there is a condensation of long-range correlations between me and each one of, uh, of you, which has brought here, and between uh, you and uh, other ones of you. So we have a condensed state. A condensed state, uh, which is an ordered state, and is a, and is a coherent state. Coherence means that we are in phase, like an orchestra. To be in phase, it means that we share the same thing, the same thinking, the same thought, the same feelings, as it happens when someone share, share the same feelings. So coherence is the basis of this model. And this is a mathematical, please notice, to me, it's not easy to translate in words what uh, I can tell you much more easily in formulas. But what I tell you uh, is very much near to the formula of the model. I want to say, I do not stretch the point. Because when you describe in words a formula, sometimes you say something which is not in the formula. But here what I'm telling you is just in the model, in the formula. The... So memory, is not affected by quantum fluctuation because of coherence. You can show that uh, by studying the coherent state. The coherent state is the, the quantum state which is nearest to classical state. And so you have a transition from a quantum state to a macroscopic quantum state. From such a point of view, for example, a crystal, a magnet, they are not classical objects. Although you cut a crystal, you sell, you buy, you give as a gift. However, that one is a macroscopic quantum state because you cannot describe that crystal without going to the basic quantum dynamics of atoms and phonons. You see, these phonons, in the case of a crystal, are something quite, uh, quite interesting, are particles, first of all, you can observe them. Uh, but if you break up the crystal, if you put uh, salt, which is a crystal, in water, the crystal uh, disassembly. You do not find any more the salt crystal. But you, do not, you find the atoms of a sodium and chlorine, but you do not find the phonons. The phonons exist as far as the crystal exists. So you have an identification of a structure, because they are particles, and a function. So in quantum field theory, a lot of uh, antinomy, they disappear. Uh, so uh, we, have, uh, we consider the brain as a macroscopic quantum state, quant made by macroscopic quantum state, or the brain as a macroscopic quantum system. But please notice macroscopic not just quantum. This is an uh, important point. And so we have a change of scale. We go, we fill the gap, going from microscopic to macroscopic, because of a coherence. You see, this gap is the same gap exactly of a biochemist. Uh, in biology, it's not clear how you can go from a biochemical uh, reactions to behavior of the whole biological systems. This is not clear. And this is one of the main problems in biology. So we have dissipation, most important thing. You cannot forget about dissipation. Then you have the time evolution of the state of the describing the state of the brain at some volume, faint volume, and this is controlled, of course, by entropy, as uh, it happens in this case of uh, thermodynamic-like uh, situations. So you have irreversibility of time evolution. You have, namely, breakdown of time reversal symmetry. You cannot reverse the arrow of time. This is why we get old. 
we cannot get young. We, we go only in one direction. The reason of this is uh, dissipation, and we express it. Since, since in principle we could go uh, both ways, backward in time and forward in time, in, a, in any physical system, in principle. But in practice, when you have a large number of particles, you go just in one direction, and this is due to statistical reasons. Here, the reason is dissipation, is the fact that the system is open to the, uh, to the world. So you get the arrow of time, which is a privileged direction in time evolution. Now it is very, very interesting that the arrow of time for people like us is the same arrow of time of thermodynamics and is the same arrow of time of cosmology. We are going all in the same time direction and we cannot reverse time. But we have an, Im an image of a time reversed uh, of ourselves. It is our double. Because uh, if you remember, the double is the mirror in time image of ourself. Mirror in time because he gets what we give and vice versa we have what it gives to us. To us. <coughs> Sorry. On this kind of time and time reversal and time breakdown of time reversal, a great contribution have been given by George Sudarshan, who is one of my god in physics, and I'm glad to present this picture here. Now, uh, if you do some experiment as Freeman has done and other ones uh, do, to the same stimulus, you do not observe the same amplitude modulated of uh, uh, assembly of coherently oscillating neurons. If you take an FNMR uh, image of the brain, you see all those blobs. Those blobs are assemblies of coherently, coherently oscillating neurons. So if you give the same stimulus to a subject uh, in different moments, you never find the same uh, distribution of blobs in the brain. This is very important to a physicist because it means that the brain is uh, autonomous in its own dynamics. This is crucial. So the brain receives inputs from the world, but then operates by itself. And uh, this also means that in the brain, you cannot say that there are representation of that stimulus, because the same stimulus gives always different excitations. So this is a crucial point. So, already, <laughs> okay, I will jump a lot of things. So what does the brain? The brain constructs meanings. Since it does not reproduce uh, stimulus, it constructs meanings. And memory, we are quite certain uh, with Walter Freeman, I collaborate with him, we are quite certain that uh, the brain does not store information. Memory is not memory of information. Memory is memory of meanings. This is a crucial point, which I would like to stress. We do not remember how tall is that guy which we met yesterday. We remember what was our relation with him. What was the meaning attached with that guy? This is the crucial point. And, uh, um, and then uh, let me jump. Uh, of course, since the interaction is always continuous and the balance is always uh, unbalanced between me and my double, uh, there is a continuous updating of a meaning. And every time I have a new perceptive experience, all my previous experiential uh, activity is fully reordered, is fully rearranged. It's not like uh, when you add one more item to a list in a dictionary. Every time uh, we have a new perception, the whole panorama of uh, previous perceptions is rearranged. So this is why we sometimes say, oh, now I understand. I change my point of view. How this is possible? If something would be wired in the brain, I cannot change. 
This is another point which comes from this model. So I told you already this, I skip. Um, and in this way, by continuous updating of meaning, knowledge is, con is constructed. And uh, a vision of the world is uh, formed for each of us. And uh, intentionality may exercise in the action perception cycle, which is so near to the whole phenomenology of uh, middle, European, middle European phenomenology of Merleau-Ponty and other people which have been also mentioned during this conference. In the case we find such beautiful balance without double, then that one is the aesthetical experience. Aesthetical experience is not necessarily artistic experience. Aesthetical experience means to be in harmony with our double. So that is the main characteristic of our brain. The dimension of our brain is pursuing the aesthetic experience, to find to be in harmony with our double. And our double is continuous changing, it tries to change us and we try to change him, so there is a continuous dialogue. And this dialogue, as I said, as I told you, perhaps is where consciousness appears. But uh, uh, so, for example, uh, the dimension of such an aesthetic experience is a surprise, astonishment. We are alive as far as we are able to be surprised. And here I like to remember some word from La Nausea is of Sartre. And suddenly, all at once, the veil is torn away. I have understood, I have seen. This is the dimension of our everyday life. Uh, where we meet with our double, F forward in time, backward in time, we meet on, uh, on the surface of this screen. The surface of this screen is the present, is the now. This is why consciousness is only present. Consciousness has no past, neither future, even to sum up all of our life before the act of, of experience. Consciousness is always in the present, is on this mirror, of a time mirror. And this uh, uh, aesthetical experience, which also means that we judge beautiful something which is for us beautiful, is no matter of discussion, because it's our aesthetical experience, and for that reason, is also aversive, because give us always a new standpoint, a new way to look at the world, a new vision of the world. So change what it was consolidated before. But, um, okay, but we cannot measure the world. We need something more, we need imagination. Just uh, two more minutes, I'm sorry. So we need to mimesis in the sense of Aristotle. And this is possible because in this model, uh, we have the possibility to have mistakes. This is a privilege, we are not machine. We have the possibility to change our mind just because uh, astonishment is our uh, dimension. Uh, and from such point of view, to think, which usually, uh, the act of thinking, let's say, usually is a rational activity, uh, is said that it is a rational activity, in this model appears more as activity coming from error, from, from making mistakes and from going around searching what, what can be useful to find for us the best of our aesthetic experience. But I have to, 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 to be quick. I, I finished. Only one thing. There is at some point, uh, I say that we, there are maybe 108 double in person in this room. We have to fit all together. So the brain is intrinsically, is, has intrinsic in it a, a social dimension. Because our double, they, they talk among them, uh, themselves, and we talk with those double. So, also science is a convenience. 
We do not go on a boat if the boat is sinking. So it's not convenient to use a boat which is sinking. This is science. Science tells us what to do if it works. But we are always ready to change our mind, to make a new model, a new theory, if that theory at some point does not work. So all of it is a social. And social means also ethical, moral, and so commitment. But uh, uh, let me skip all of it. I told you coherence. Now it happens that nature loves fractals. Fractal, you can show, are macroscopic quantum system. Here uh, I could say something more, but my chairman will kill me. So I just give you such a hint. Fractals, as you observe in nature in many, many occasions, are macroscopic quantum systems. Their basis is a quantum dynamics, which is a coherent dynamics. So from what I'm saying, it emerged that we have an integrated vision of nature on the basis of a coherence. And, um, and in biology, especially in biology, people like to talk about codes. DNA, DNA is the genetic code. But coherence comes before codes. Nature is not a hierarchy of codes. Nature is a coherent, uh, lives on the basis of a coherent dynamics. I'm sorry I cannot be longer on this point. But maybe uh, we could read together this word by Darwin, which are famous words. In this view of life, with its several powers, having them originally breathed into a few form or into one, from so simple a beginning, endless form, most beautiful and most wonderful have been, have been and are being evolved. The basis of this, from the point of view of a physicist uh, used to quantum field theory, is the coherent dynamics. I have pictures which uh, do not belong to, to time, it's just picture. Fractals. <laughs> Just because they're... Oh, by the way, this is the brain. That one is brain. It is uh, one of the experiments uh, everybody can do. Spirals, they were at the beginning of our talk. S uh, fractals everywhere. And beautiful picture, you see, this created a bot. One uh, logarithmic spiral and its double, because uh, conservation uh, balancing of energy is uh, crucial. And uh, uh, also the galaxy, this one is our. So, um, thank you. presentation and just make a few comments. It was particularly delightful to see George Sudarshan on the screen who has given many great lectures here and including his comments on consciousness. And he in particular has developed a quantum theory of open systems that I have discussed with him and you actually have to develop it and use non-self-adjoint dynamics. This is just a comment for you. Now, particular comment on your theory. When I was at MIT, we used to find Sergio Fubini and, uh, and Gabriele Veneziano in the corridor. And Fubini would be saying, voglio insisto. I wish to insist that a particular property is true. If you wish to obtain long-range coherence, which I also strongly advocate for a description of consciousness, you cannot go to quantum states. You have to remain at the critical points. You have to remain at the points of breakdown of symmetry, not go to the places where the symmetry has been completely broken. There were many, uh, many comments in the 70s and 80s, particularly by Sir Roger Penrose, that there had to be long-range coherence, which they thought was quantum coherence 
to support consciousness. But the everyone then and since has decided that you cannot get long-range quantum coherence at the, uh, the uh, room temperature. But what you can have is long-range critical point coherence. The critical points are the points of breakdown of symmetry, as you so rightly pointed out. And if you center everything at the critical points, which is known in complexity biology as criticality, then I think everything that you were telling us is true. And I really want to congratulate you on it. Thank you very much. Any comments would be very, very welcome. I'm the one that thank you. Uh, you see, I had no time to say exactly what you said. So uh, we were not, uh, uh, how to say, um, before uh, this session, we, we did not took agreement in such a way I could have more time. So thank you. In the model is exactly that. We have uh, many unitarily equivalent representations, which you only uh, have in quantum field theory, and you just operate at the critical points, exactly. Brain goes, if you remember in one of my slides, there was O of T, the ground states, uh, with the label N, and that T is time. At each time, you have a different representation meaning that you go through a continuous undergoing phase transitions. So each time you have a critical uh, phenomena. And this uh, criticality of the brain is what gives you these scale-free uh, graphs, which I was pointing to, which are those graphs, they are exactly uh, isomorph in their uh, formal description with coherent states in quantum field theory. And uh, uh, you have uh, this, I'm sorry, just a notation because we share uh, the same love. <laughs> you might describe that with the Q deformed Hope algebra because you have the double link of the, but in any case, it will be a pleasure if we, if we can talk. So we do have what you say. Thank you. Uh, well, particularly um, has advocated self-organized criticality as the, the signature of conscious states in the brain waves. And I would imagine that your interactions with Walter Freeman, with whom I was put in contact by Stuart Hameroff in 2012, that your interaction with Walter Freeman would point to exactly these factors as well. Yes, indeed, with Walter Freeman we are continuously in contact. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Tapas Tata. The question is for Professor Ghosh. Um, so I have come across, uh, I think, a work of Mollachina and others in which he has shown that these uh, you know, non-local particles can be connected in a higher dimension by a wormhole, and therefore, apparently, the action at a distance is not so spooky, and therefore, you know, it can be classically viewed. So I'm not a quantum physicist, uh, but is, is this understanding correct? And if it were so, uh, does it explain spooky action at a distance classically, this work of Maldacina? Uh, is there a comment or a question? No, a question. I, I, hmm? I'm, I'm asking to shed more light on it. If, if that, that I am not very familiar with Maldicina's work, and I, I don't like going to higher dimensions. I would like to understand everything in four dimensions. That's okay. where we live. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, in relation to the uh, quantum entanglement, I've been reading a lot on quantum physics and meeting with uh, many quantum physicists. And one thing which always uh, still remains a puzzle for me is that to say the quantum physicists, they would say that, oh, this is the final theory. And then Albert Einstein saying that it's a spooky action at a distance. And or say, uh, as God uh, say, God does not play dice. So all these remarks from there, we see that there is a constant uh, conflict with Albert Einstein, 
and particularly quantum physics presentation of the quantum uh, entanglement. So my question is that quantum entanglement, the physicists who very much adhere to this concept, I think there are three angles. One is the observation, the experiment. Number two is the mathematical calculation. Number three is the conclusion. There's the quantum entanglement ha happening. So in these three things, if all three are accurate, they, I don't see any reason why can't the Albert Einstein I uh, should not be happy about it. So Sorry, one, can you repeat that last sentence? Okay, the first one, the, the thing is that if the quantum physicists in relation to the quantum entanglement concept, if that is perfectly accurate as they claim, they so strongly claim that, then I see three angles. One is the experiments, experiments that they did, one, accuracy of the experiment. Number two is the mathematical calculation which is associated with this experiment, to confirm that experiment. Number three is their own conclusion. So therefore, this is the quantum entanglement efficacy. So now, what I'm lost, or what I see a dilemma, is that if the mathematical calculation is correct, why not Albert Einstein should be able to see that? If the experiment is correct, why not Albert Einstein should be able to see that? So now, if Albert Einstein still, if he's unhappy, he should be unhappy with the conclusion. So how come that quantum physicists pertaining to the quantum entanglement, what made them conclude that this entanglement is efficacious? This is my question, thank you. Okay, I didn't quite understand the question. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I did not understand the last question. What is the question? Can you repeat it, please? The question, to make it very simple, is that um, the quantum physicists pertaining to uh, quantum entanglement they're so sure that this is the fact. At the same time, Albert Einstein stood against that. So if Albert Einstein stood against that, I see I'm very naive. I've, I'm not at all. I've been interacting with the physicists, reading quantum, quantum mechanics and materials, but I'm not really into quantum, uh, the experiments. So from my point of view, very naive understanding point of view, I see only three angles. Okay. One is the experiment which they did to make them feel that this is quantum entanglement. Yeah, I understand that. One. Number two is the mathematical yeah. derivation, number two. Then number three is their own conclusion. Therefore, with this experiment, plus supported by the mathematical derivation, this quantum entanglement is efficacious. Which means efficacious. it's true. It's true. This yeah. is the reality. Yeah. Quantum entanglement is a reality. Yeah. Whereas Albert Einstein is very unhappy. Spooky actually is a distance. This is his sarcastic remark against that. So the question is, Albert Einstein, did he fail to appreciate the mathematical derivation? Did he fail to appreciate the experiment? Or is he not, was he not happy with the conclusion drawn by the quantum physicist? This is my question. Well, at, uh, <clears throat> in Einstein's time, of course, there was no empirical evidence for entanglement. In fact, he had said that, give me one piece of evidence where you see such strange things. There weren't. It was uh, only after aspects, experiments and so on that people actually produced entangled states. And now, of course, that is a reality. Now, what Einstein would have said, uh, I don't know, it's anybody's guess. But the point about uh, entanglement is that it is, uh, I mean, nobody, I think, will challenge the fact that there is entanglement. But the consequence of entanglement usually is to say that there is non-locality, there is a spooky action at a distance. That interpretation Einstein challenged and he said, if you just give up your claim that your wave function is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the ontic reality, then I have no problem with your theory. Next uh, question. Subrata Chattopadhyay. I am a medical physiologist and I have a que two questions. One for Professor Ralph Abraham and another uh, is for Professor Partho Ghosh. Uh, you said mathematical cognition may be considered as a form of meditation. So my question is that uh, everybody given the learning opportunities uh, can learn some mathematics at least, but not everybody can undergo mystic experience. Do you believe mathematics is more universal than mysticism? <laughs> well, uh, 
Well, I, I carefully avoided the, any use of the word mysticism. I said at the outset, I only consider these things which are uh, <clears throat> aspects that you might consider mystical, which I have the direct uh, experience. So of these, one <clears throat> is mathematical work. Uh, I didn't say mathematical cognition. I said mathematical work on the frontiers of the subject as an intellectual activity is a form of meditation. So uh, no word mystical here. And this is for uh, Professor Ghosh. Uh, neurological experiments are ruling out the possibility or the proof of existence of free will. Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, since experiment of Benjamin Libet on free will, the neurophysiology, uh, there is evidence that free will actually doesn't exist in neurophysiology. Now, Einstein was not supportive of the notion of free will. His metaphor was, if moon were endowed with consciousness, the moon will think that it is moving around its orbit out of its own free will. Now, we kind of, in, in, in medicine, we kind of relied on quantum mechanics, non-locality of mind, and believed in existence of free will, uh, so long, I mean, in this period. Now, my question is, how are we to reconcile the notion of free will with classical mechanics? Well, first of all, this was not part of what I said at all. It's something quite different. Uh, the entire question of free will uh, is, is a difficult one. But um, uh, would anybody else like to answer yes? I didn't have time to enter the notion free will. Um, several people already have indicated that determinism and free will are compatible. And what is the free will then? First of all, even if everything is determined, our actions are still important. Take, for example, a thermostat. I gave it the other day to my friends here. A thermostat is completely determined, but still it's important that's there. That for one. Secondly, um, a completely deterministic algorithm can give unexpected outcome. And we have seen examples here. So what is free will? That it's a kind of machine that takes into account all the data of your body and mind, um, your environment, your conscience, and then it turns. We don't know what is coming out. You have to live in order to know what comes out. So I would say there is free will, but it's not yours. Quite like um, our friend here said, it's not mine. And that's the essence. Um, it's a selfless free will. The question of attention and our ability to attain is extremely important. In the field of neuroscience of attention, attention is considered as two modes. One is vector mode or channel mode, and the second is a matrix mode or a state mode. And in some sense, the matrix acts as a source or a sink for the attentional activity and the vector creates the subject-object duality or, and our experience. Now, <clears throat> in the field of meditation, at least some of the researchers are describing three different modes of meditation. One is a focal meditation where you focus on an object, subject and object, and concentration basically. Second is an open monitoring mode or mindfulness where you are receptive to whatever is happening in the field at a given moment. And the third, interestingly, is a transcendent mode, self-transcendence. Now, this self-transcendence is a kind of funny and interesting state in the sense suddenly a point becomes the infinity, an individual being becomes the universal being. Some may say a part becomes the whole.
and some may say it's not even a part, a whole which is embedded in another whole becomes the whole. So, <clears throat> of course, experientially this self-transcendent state has been beautifully described in Vedic and Vedantic literature. I just want to give you one or two examples. One example, when Hanuman is talking to Sri Rama, Lord Rama, and he says, Deha bhavena dasosmi, jiva bhavena tvadausha kaha, atma bhavena tvamevaham itime nishchitamati. What he is saying that what I experience depends on my perspective. When I think I am the physical body, then I am your servant. When I think I am a living being, then I am a small part of you. And when I think that I am the Atman or Brahman, then I am you. And this is my firm conviction. You see, another beautiful, beautiful statement is by King Janaka in Ashtavakra Gita. And he says, Akashavat Anantoham Ghatavat Prakrutam Jagat Itid Jnanam Athaitasya Na Tyago Na Graho Na Laya. What he is saying that I am like the infinite sky, infinite space. <coughs> and this all this world that I experience is like a small jar within my field, a small object. So when I have this feeling that everything is this and I am that, then there is no question of accepting this or rejecting that or this or that. There is no duality. So my question to you is, can you mathematically image these three modes of meditation? especially the self-transcendence, where suddenly the perspective changes from an individual to the infinite. Thank you. Maybe Hank has an answer to that. When there is a self that we are attached to, we are in a strange attractor that always circles around a certain concept, the concept of self as a fixed entity. And, and the aim is to see self as a, as a process that can be different. But we are, it is so much in us to think of this fixed concept that we have difficulty to letting it go. And uh, what I tried to do was to simplify um, the lifeline, the stream of consciousness, so that there is very little input and very little output. And the only thing we see is state changes. And at that point, and you're right to mention open monitoring, at that point, a meditation goes over from concentration. The concentration was necessary to cut down the input and the output. At that point, time, it goes from um, focusing on something to open monitoring of the states. But since we have only finitely many states, we make circles. And when we see that we are in a circle, we step out. We get a reset. And, and that's uh, the model I have to go to the change of view. Could I, uh, yes, since you asked me a question? Yes. <laughs> um, so you asked if I thought, uh, this is a yes or no question, uh, if I thought that mathematics could model these three states, right? And uh, uh, my answer would be no, this is not what I think. Uh, I think that uh, science and uh, neuroscience and uh, quantum field theory and uh, mathematical logic and dynamical systems theory and attractors and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, th th this can never succeed to uh, make a model of existence or experience 
I think that, you know, say the quantum field theory, here we have to do with the phonons, the vibratory states of uh, matter. This is restricted to the lower levels of the tower of all levels in the big picture of all, all and everything. I, I think it's too much to ask of mathematics as we know it now to go any distance toward the transcendental experience. It just won't do. And to keep on using it as metaphors for the experience only impoverishes our understanding of those experiences. Thank you. So, Victoria, please. Sorry. May I talk? Uh, my question is to Professor Barentrecht. Thank you very much for your brilliant presentation of the Theravada Abhidharma system. Uh, it was very interesting for me to, to note that there are some considerable differences between uh, a Sanskrit uh, uh, version of Abhidharma and uh, the Pali one, the Theravada. Uh, and one thing uh, was a surprise for me. Uh, perhaps uh, I didn't understand you correctly, but you have mentioned uh, some principle which you have called something like uh, uh, Base baseline, mm -hmm. so uh, which uh, which could be preserved from from the birth uh, through the whole life till death. Uh, it seems to me that uh, if it is if I understand you correctly, uh, that in that case it may enter in contradiction with the basic Buddhist principles of anicca, impermanence. Uh, 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 momentaries, uh, and it may come closer to uh, the doctrine of Atman, which all the Buddhists, as far as I know, reject. Yeah, that's an interesting question. First of all, the name of that baseline in Pali is um, Bhavanga. Do you have that also yes, in I, Sanskrit? Uh, no, we don't have that. It's a, a quite special doctrine of Theravada. Uh -huh. I, I know that. And um, this Bhavanga theory is embedded in the theory of rebirth. I'm agnostic to rebirth, therefore I didn't mention it. But after dying, according to that theory, you can improve your baseline. So there is an improvement. Um, during this life, this bhavanga is stable, but it is kind of nothing. Uh, no perception occurs there. Um, all the interesting things happen in the, in the vittis, where there's input Vritti, and output. Vritti in Sanskrit. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's all I can say that mm -hmm. But One shouldn't consider it as an Atman. This vaguely, vaguely resembles uh, Atman. Yeah, I agree. Uh, sometimes also the karma vaguely remembers an, an self, and the karma goes on to the next life. And no, we will discuss it later. Thank you. We are referring uh, many times to this SSB, uh, symmetry breaking, breakdown. Uh, could you explain the, uh, the context in which you are uh, speak, uh, talking about this SSB? SSB. You uh, are spontaneous symmetry, symmetry breakdown. Period. What is the context in which you are talking about SSB in the, when, when you are making the presentation? Could well, you explain it a little the more? The context in which you bring that idea. Uh, uh, well, um, you see, since uh, maybe uh, 60 years uh, in uh, quantum field theory, people uh, speak of a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry, or uh, uh, SSB or SBS, whatever. And uh, uh, this is the basis, for example, of the best theory we have at this time, which is uh, quantum electrodynamics and uh, electro and weak interaction. So the standard model of elementary particle physics. Uh, so, um, which is already something we want to go uh, beyond. Uh, is not uh, so 
good in some aspects, but uh, on the other end, it's the best we have at the moment. So uh, the idea of spontaneous breakdown of symmetry um, is born, uh, let me say, around the 1930, um, when uh, um, there were, uh, it was already uh, quite well known, the algebra, the, the formal structure, how to deal with uh, electrons with spin up and spin down, we have seen in the talk by Professor Gosha. Um, then Heisenberg, he was uh, uh, trying to study protons and, nu and neutrons and he thought that they could be taken as being the same particle with different quantum numbers, which were not the spin in this case, although they have a spin, but uh, uh, this quantum number uh, was uh, uh, after given the name of a baryon uh, number. In any case, this single particle was the nucleon, and it was a doublet. However, they are not just like the electrons, because electron with spin up and electron with spin down, uh, they have the same energy if there is no magnetic field around. In the case of a neutron, neutron is a little bit heavier as a mass, higher than the proton mass. So the symmetry is broken. You cannot treat those as would be uh, for electrons. So. You start with the symmetry, which tells you that you have just one particle, but then for some reason, such a symmetry appears to us as a broken symmetry. You see? So the breakdown of symmetry allows, however, the possibility to make a distinction if you have a neutron or a proton. What breaks the symmetry in that case is the electrical charge. So a nucleon with a charge positive is a proton, with zero charge is a neutron. But in principle, somewhere where, uh, suppose you have no instrument to measure charge and also no instrument to measure masses, they are exactly the same object. So the idea of uh, a symmetry which is uh, broken in a dynamical way, not by end, uh, is very important in physics, and is the origin, is the main hypothesis which uh, brings you in a mathematical way, and then also uh, you can test experimentally, to such uh, long wave correlations, which are called uh, the quanta of such longer wave correlations, uh, number, number Goldstone particles. These particles are very interesting because I was telling you about the phonon, the magnon, the Cooper pair. Uh, you find also in the standard model, but there you do not see. They do not belong to the spectrum of the particle which you can observe. They are hided where? In the vacuum, in the quantum vacuum, the one which is around us because uh, elementary particles, they live with us in this uh, special moment of uh, universal life. So a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry is a crucial point. It's from where we get uh, significant information, translating in a different field. In the model, uh, since it's a quantum field theory model, uh, it is a possibility to have many, many electrical dipoles oriented in principle in any direction, so with a rotational symmetry, you break it and you get a, a special direction. This might be in the space, if they are polarized, uh, pointing in the same direction, or also in time, namely they remain each one in each direction, but in time they have a common phase of oscillation. Thank you. So, uh, uh, sorry, the last question is George, I think. Uh, I, we need uh, to, to stop, and therefore there is a last question by George. That what upholds this universe is omnipresent, is completely unchanged. It's an absolute unity out of which the relative diversity, ma the relative diversity manifests. And we can understand the relationship between these two as a fundamental state of symmetry, which manifests by the process of breaking of symmetry. 
So, George, the last question. Yeah, I, thank you. My question is for the uh, for the last talk. Um, my feeling is that you basically describe the brain environment or what I call world brain interface and um, sort of in biological, physical terms. That's the way what I, yeah. So my feeling is, um, of course, and I would agree with that, that you would describe the brain environment interface as you called it or as I would call it world brain interface in biological terms based on the quantum field theory. And I probably agree with that, but my problem is you infer from that 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 is basic for consciousness. Again, I would very much agree with that. Consciousness is not an intra-individual thing. It's an inter-individual phenomenon, that's for sure. So you will never locate, in classical Western terms, consciousness in the brain itself. I completely agree with that. My problem is that I have the feeling you did not do much more than I did. I did not show how this world brain interface is central for consciousness. I could have shown that by testing it in vegetative state patient, I haven't done that yet, with specific paradigm. And my feeling is that's a claim. You make a claim that this interface is relevant for consciousness, which of course I agree, but you didn't show it experimentally. So and for me the interesting thing would be how to show this experimentally. Let's for instance say that's your expertise as a physicist, <clears throat> then let's say that you show that the power law structure of the world predicts the power law structure of the brain. That, and that in turn predicts your experience and consciousness. So that's my first question that maybe some of the formula which you then probably need to apply across world and brain as common unit of measurement and that it's set in relation to consciousness. Yeah? The, then two very short conceptual issues. My feeling is that what you mean by meaning, by the concept of meaning, is not the usual concept of meaning as the philosopher would mean it. The philosopher means by meaning a semantic meaning, a conceptual meaning. My feeling is that your meaning is much more basic. It's relevance uh, that persists across fluctuations, it may be more dynamic. Can, can you make it brief, George? And we... last thing, philosophically, my feeling is that this would be very in accordance close to Whitehead and Bergson, particularly the concept of memory. Thank you. A brief answer. I, I will try very to be brief. short, yes. So, uh, you see, I'm a poor theoretical physicist. I will ask to some friend of experimentalists to do such experiment that capturing the consciousness. But uh, I'm joking, of course. But uh, um, that is, uh, I, I said, please don't kill me. And so uh, why would I like to kill me? <laughs> it's, it's just uh, a suggestion that came from the model. I do not pretend to have such. Uh, but uh, one thing is clear to me, that without dissipation, without openness, you will, you will cannot talk of a consciousness. Now, is matter, uh, I mean, how to say, is a uh, neuroscientist that they should try, psychologist, philosopher. Um, experiments are not just uh, made by physicists. About, the, um, you were asking a question, the second one was, uh, uh, you were asking another uh, couple of questions, I forgot now. Um, you were saying two more things. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so but uh, I think it's uh, we we can uh, go on with the discussion. Yes, yes. At the yeah. post, so we have the the post now, and then a new session begins. Thank okay. you very much to all.